like Jean said, the whole foreign animal disease thing is a process. It is not an event. And my husband and I, along with our team of people at JWB Pork, are producers in southeast Iowa. And we had the opportunity uh, three years ago now to participate in the, the field exercise or the demo project or whatever you call it about um, ASF response or foreign animal disease response. And were it not for that, I would be 100% clueless about almost all of those acronyms up there. And I still remain semi-clueless about a large percentage of them. So that's what I mean by it's a process, not an event. It's kind of confusing. But the first thing to remember is with any of this is what can we do to make this not happen? Because some people consider it to be inevitable that it will happen. I don't know if that's true or not. But I do know that when the fire comes or when the war comes, so to speak, it's going to be really hard to get a bunch of um, behavior changing and make all of these mid-course corrections that could have been done in what we call peacetime. So th first of all, thank you for being here in so-called peacetime to be preparing yourselves and getting a little more familiar with what can I do to, to be more ready when that challenge comes because we recognize you can't implement all of these kind of things instantly. The producer, Anna Forseth, is a, a veterinarian with National Pork, or National Pork Producers Council. Pam Zobel in the middle, National Pork Board. And Tyler Hulk, Hulk is a vet with the US Ship Project. And NPPC, NPB, SHIP are just three <laughs> of those many <laughs> soup things we had in the previous slide there. Um, the this whole thing, this whole thing, what happens when ASF comes, or for that matter, it could be a different foreign animal disease, but we're thinking about ASF, and it was really ironic from 2019 um, when we did the tabletop exercise, how the whole thing unfolded with COVID in the midst of the ASF, and COVID did a great job of illustrating what underpreparedness looks like. I mean, we've, we've come through three years of absolute crazy turmoil that at some level perhaps could have been avoided. Obviously, it's different to talk about one aspect of an industry compared to an entire population. But the, first, the first thing to remember in all of this, think about prevention. What are the things that we can do on farm that will um, mitigate the risk of having ASF to deal with in our own operation? I don't know about you guys, but for me personally, I don't want to be patient zero in this. I don't want to be farm zero, as it may be. And so that's kind of motivational. I, I want to do the biosecurity things. I want to get our growers to do the, the biosecurity things that make it extremely unlikely that African swine fever is going to be inside the walls of any barns that I happen to be the owner of the pigs in. Um, then there's a whole bunch of other things that happen as the process begins to unfold as far as, as, far as what do you have to do to, to regain business? And again, I don't know about you guys, but the idea that we're going to have some amount of um, freeze, stand still, don't move, that's problematic. And so the idea of how to shorten that as much as possible, because we in our operation and maybe in yours depend heavily on the day-to-day -day cash flow that goes with selling pigs. Because right now, while you're writing checks for $8 corn, it would be nice to have revenue come in to fund those checks. So, so I'm, I'm highly motivated, let's say it like that. Um, so again, summary of the same things I just said. Um, let's keep it out. Let's figure out how to be ready if it comes, whether it comes to wherever. You know, it could happen in, in Florida, and we might be doing everything right in our own individual operations, but it's still going to have an impact on us. And so, you know, we, we can think, well, we're kind of insulated for some reason because of our own practices. But these are... These are preparedness steps that we need to get, whether ASF ever touches the state of Iowa or the state of Nebraska or wherever, um, so that we can continue to do business on a global level. And each of these things is, can be massively daunting. So when you listen here, listen lightly, and think about the goal is before the end of the, of the session is that when you leave here, what do I, where am I? And what could I do by the end of June? What's one thing I could do by the end of June? 
what's another thing maybe I could do by the end of July or August. Don't let the overwhelmedness of, oh my gosh, there's so much stuff, don't let that scare you away from doing anything. So with that, Anna is our first presenter here. All right, thank you, Heidi. You can hear me okay? Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here with us. Um, I'm going to start my portion of the presentation uh, just to give you guys a, a background and an update on where African swine fever is. And we're going to focus on the Western Hemisphere. We're going to focus on recent, recent um, events in Hispaniola. And then we're going to bring it back, bring it back and talk more about what we're doing to pre prepare um, domestically. So I wanted to start with a, a comment that I heard by Dr. Jack Shear recently on a conference call. Um, according to the World Trade Organization, African swine fever has resulted in more meat production loss than any other disease in history. I think we have heard African swine fever described in a lot of ways. We've seen a lot of numbers, a lot of stats. But this, this hit me, and, and I hope that it hits some of you as well. This is a, this is a big deal. And, and we all know that. You all know that. And that's why you're here today. So I, I apologize. It's a little bit difficult to see with the lighting. Um, but in July of 2021, so we're about to that one-year mark, African swine fever was identified in the Dominican Republic. And that's a, that's a big deal for a few reasons. One, it hasn't been in the Western Hemisphere for almost 40 years. And it's very close to the peninsula of Florida. So it's, it's knocking on our door, so to speak. Another concern, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail, is that it's even closer to Puerto Rico. And again, we'll, we'll cover why that's, why that's in, important. But um, July of last year, we learned that African swine fever is getting close to the US border. And that, that was really the takeaway. And a lot has been done since then to protect the US swine industry. So um, as of a couple of weeks ago, the update as far as the, the spread, the surveillance testing that's been done on the island of Hispaniola, we are told that 30 of 32 provinces in the Dominican Republic have detected positive cases, and then 10 of the 12 departments in Haiti. So we'll just say that it's all over the island. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the the work that's being done with the Dominican Republic and the work that's being done with Haiti. But as you can see on this map, I mean, it's one land mass. And so the efforts that are done in the DR are, are going to affect those that are done in Haiti and vice versa. So <clears throat> just for background, a little bit about the Dominican Republic swine industry. And that's really going to be our focus, um, what's, what's being done with the DR. Um, for various reasons, um, our, our work with Haiti has been slow, and, and we'll cover that in a minute. But um, we're going to focus on um, the last year's worth of efforts um, with, with the DR, and I guess even, even a little bit further back from 2019, we've been working with them more closely. But the Dominican Republic has a, a little under 2 million pigs. Um, they have just four genetic or seed stock producers that we consider to be commercial producers, 22 producers that have between 500 and 2,000 sows, 308 commercial producers with less than 500 sows, and then they've got thousands of um, individuals with backyard pigs. Pork is a widely consumed protein on the island, and so um, that's why you're gonna, gonna have so many people that are just raising pigs for home consumption. To add to this list, there are um, pigs that we would consider to be maybe semi-domestic, but just running loose, and then certainly have an established feral, um, feral swine population as well, which, as you un can understand, complicates um, the process to try to control and eradicate a disease like African swine fever. So the US, USDA and uh, the Dominican Republic started working together on surveillance testing in 2019. As you all remember well, I'm, I'm sure, 2018 African swine fever and its movement through Asia kind of perked everyone's ears up and got our attention. And so we started working with the Dominican Republic on, on surveillance. So they would uh, collect samples. Oftentimes, these are from feral pigs, bank them, and then on a quarterly basis, send them up to Plum Island, the, um, the USDA laboratory, for testing. Um, 
that's when the samples, um, or so the samples that were tested in July of 2021 represented animals that were tested months before July. So it wasn't as though the virus was introduced in July and that's when it got there. It is more likely that it was there months, months prior. As uh, following the diagnosis and as we started to work with the Dominican Republic, um, there were certainly some challenges that um, were identified pretty quickly. A few of those are um, there's you know virtually no or, or very limited movement controls, and this is both dom with domestic animals, but also with the feral swine population. It's hard to control um, a group like that. Lack of communication um, within responders to these um, uh, uh, producers reporting clinical signs. Um, delayed response to calls, and that's not ideal when it comes to, to a, um, a foreign animal disease situation. There are limited resources. Uh, one example would be hog snares, something that we're very familiar with here in the U.S. and we use widely. Um, they didn't have them, and so when we talk about trying to collect samples and submit samples and be on top of things like that, that was a resource that they didn't have. Um, so again, just to give you an idea kind of where, where they were at when this all, um, when, when this was identified on the island. And then importantly, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but there's no enforced regulation against garbage feeding, or at least wasn't at the time. Um, they receive cargo ships from Russia, China, and other places, um, but that's assumed to be how ASF was introduced into the island, was from cargo ships. In fact, um, as we look closer at some of these um, strains, we can see that it was, it, it's also likely that there were multiple introductions. And so um, garbage feeding is likely to be a source um, of, of how it was introduced. So the USDA in uh, September of 2021 committed $500 million to controlling and eradicating ASF in, in Hispaniola and then preventing the introduction into the United States. This is a really big deal for two reasons. This, the amount of money was huge, that, that was a big deal, but also the fact that USDA committed this amount of money to a disease that the United States doesn't have is also a big deal and, and made a statement really that, that they're committed, they understand the risk and they're committed um, to, to keeping it out of the US. So as we, um, were you know, given funding, USDA was given funding to go out and work with, we have to understand that these are sovereign countries and we, we work with them, right? We have, they, they, they um, have to um, accept w what we want to do and how we want to help them. Um, a few examples of what USDA is doing, boots on the ground there in the Dominican Republic and then um, kind of at a, um, a limited level with Haiti again for, for some various reasons is helping them develop or um, set up their incident command structure, which is really, um, it, it's, a, it's a structure that's used widely, um, even outside of agriculture, but um, it helps people understand who's doing what and keeps their response organized. Um, they help them develop surveillance and response plans, which is important. Where is the infection at and how are we going to handle it? Um, and then the lab is getting a lot of attention and um, funding. Um, so that they can hopefully be self-sufficient one day and not um, rely on the USDA lab in, in Plum Island for testing. So troubleshooting equipment, training technicians and employees, um, some kind of remodeling or reconstruction um, is, is where some of that, that money is, is going in the, in the DR. And again, Haiti, there's so many, if you follow the news, you're aware, there's so many other issues going on in Haiti right now that a foreign animal disease, as much as we prioritize it here, it's just, it's, it's probably number 70 on a list of other things that, that they're trying to deal with. So there have been conversations, but they're far behind um, in progress when compared to the Dominican Republic. So again, recognizing that these two countries are one island, um, that's, um, that can be concerning. So we're gonna shift focus a little bit from the Dominican Republic and Haiti and now um, talk some about Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. This, the timing of, of the protection zone was very interesting because it's a concept that was first introduced in May of 2021. 
and then the diagnosis in the Dominican Republic happened in July of 2021. And so the U.S. is really the first to use um, a protection zone or try to get it implemented. Um, but essentially, we um, recognize that Puerto Rico being a U.S. territory, so maybe I should mention, if, why are we focused on Puerto Rico? If Puerto Rico or the U.S. Virgin Islands get a positive case of African swine fever, that can impact the export market for mainland U.S. So that is why we are focused on Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Even though they are away from us because they're U.S. territory, that can have an impact. So here we are um, implementing a protection zone around Puerto Rico. They're obviously at higher risk because of their proximity to the Dominican Republic. So um, the, the criteria for this protection zone is that we are going to limit export of certain products, so live swine, germplasm, certain pork, unprocessed pork products can't come to the U.S. There's surveillance testing being done in Puerto Rico. There's outreach and education happening in Puerto Rico, which all suggests that they are decreasing their risk for becoming infected. So, um, so that, that's happening. That's happening right now. The kicker is just because they have a protection zone doesn't mean that all of our trading partners accept it. So right now, USDA is working with our top 20 trading partners to try to get them to approve the protection zone so that in the event that Puerto Rico does get a positive case, they will still accept exports from mainland US. So um, we've, we've worked with Japan and Canada as of today um, to accept, but um, there's obviously plenty of others that um, are still on the list. So uh, some efforts underway in Puerto Rico, similar to those in the Dominican Republic, um, focusing on their diagnostic lab capacity. Um, ideally, these, these islands can, can be self-sufficient to a degree um, in their testing. And so um, they've been working with their, their diagnostic lab. They've increased inspections at boat, uh, boat traffic. So um, as you could probably assume there's both legal and illegal boat traffic that come to these islands. And so they're trying to keep tabs on that. And then importantly, recognizing how ASF got into, or we assume got into the Dominican Republic, they're increasing inspections of licensed garbage feeders. There's 165 PREMs in Puerto Rico that are feeding garbage, gar licensed garbage feeders. So they're doing extra surveillance of any domestic swine at these PREMs. Um, and they're also doing um, some surveillance testing and removal of feral swine on the island as well. So just to give you an idea, um, 325 samples were tested last year. So um, as far as uh, bringing it back again more domestically, as far as our borders, a couple um, stats here first, um, as far as international travel. Over 130 million air travelers cross our border every year. And I should also say that these are 2018 stats, so this is pre-COVID. Um, and then five times that many across land, land crossings. Um, there was a two to 3% increase in referrals to egg inspectors between 2018 and 2019. And there was a 5% increase in the level of interdictions. So why is this a concern? These products can carry this virus and can be a risk, right? And so um, when you see that 1,100 meat products are seized each day, that, that should, I mean, that, that's a big deal, right? And so that sets the stage for um, my next slide here. The Agriculture Quarantine Inspection Program um, are the individuals, uh, or is the program um, w where individuals are looking for these um, prohibit prohibited products, um, both uh, in, in airports um, uh, and then cargo, car cargo areas would be another um, big focus point of theirs. So as you could understand, user fees, um, they're funded with, with user fees. So when you book an international flight and you see fees but don't get any description, our inclination is to get frustrated but know that some of that is going to AQI, so it's a, it's a good deal, right? But when COVID happened and people stopped traveling, um, these fees fell dramatically, thus their funding fell dramatically. And so what happened is they, um, 
moved a lot of these individuals that were working in airports over to the cargo area. And the results were, um, were wonderful, but also terrifying. So this, I know you can't read these numbers, that's not the point, but this red line here is March of 2020, and this is the pork products, um, the, the interdictions at cargo. And so you can see that because we had more resources looking for um, prohibited products in the cargo area, we were finding more of it. So, ah, so oops, I missed an important, um, important point here. So um, when the user fees fell, NPPC and over 200 other ag groups recognized the, the risk or the concern associated with that. And so we worked um, to get $635 million in appropriations in um, 2021, and then another $250 million this year to keep these people employed, and you can see why. So Beagle Brigade would be another update that I wanted to share with you guys. I'm not sure how many of you have seen these dogs in action, but they're, they're really awesome. Um, there are over 165 canine teams, and they're kind of strategically placed in areas where we see higher um, international travel. Um, the Beagle Brigade Act of 2022 is also something that um, NPPC is working on to try to authorize the National Detector Dog Training Center in Georgia. Um, right now, it's not um, like permanently funded, and so this is a big deal to, um, to keep this um, program up and running so that we can continue to, um, to get these dogs out in airports because they're a huge asset. They can do things we cannot, so they're a big, they're a big deal. And then the last slide, um, everybody, it seems, uh, rightly so, has questions about uh, feral pigs, right? Um, and you can see the map here highlighting the counties in which um, feral pigs um, reside, unfortunately. Um, there's a lot of them. And so um, USDA Wildlife Services has um, identified 30 high-risk counties in Georgia, Florida, Louisiana, and Texas. And they are taking advantage of um, current feral swine control programs and are implementing surveillance um, for both African swine fever and classical swine fever. Um, so that, that testing um, is under, is, it will be underway shortly, if not already. Um, so in order to talk about on-farm preparedness, I wanna first frame a little bit what would happen if we had African swine fever in the United States to help you understand those first few days and why it's so important to prepare and what we can do to prepare um, if, it, if it would arrive. So from what we understand, uh, if there is a diagnosis of ASF in the United States, the animal health officials will be instituting a 72-hour standstill. And what that is, is that the animals that are already in transit, they're already on the trucks moving, or the semen that's already being distributed will continue to move, um, but no new movements will be initiated. And so animals will not be loaded out at that point. That idea of the 72 hours is to give the animal health officials time to start with that first case, figure out potentially where, where did this virus come from to get on the farm, for animals and items that moved off the farm, has it spread to other locations, to do additional diagnostics in the area and to look where is the virus and where it isn't. Can they do that in 72 hours? It may be longer, depending on how many cases they're finding and, and um, what that looks like. So again, the animals in transit, allow them to continue to their destination while this investigation um, continues on. As they find positive cases, they will be dry, drawing control areas around those positive premises. And um, if you're in that control area and you're not positive or have a, no sign of disease, you will still be quarantined. And how that affects you is um, you cannot move any animals or semen. Um, depending on where the state is, there may be some other items that need to be permitted. But in order to move any animals, um, semen, et cetera, off your farm, you will need a movement permit. So let's talk just a little bit about those control areas. I have one drawn here on the map. Um, but again, depending on how many sites are diagnosed as positive, um, there may be one large circle. There may be several small circles. They could overlap. It may be an entire state. It may be a region. It depends how many positive cases are identified. And again, that's what that initial time um, is set up to do. After um, that initial standstill and they start allowing movement under movement permits, um, again, the diagnostics will continue, uh, movement permits to move anything within that control area. So 
let's talk just a little bit about movement permits. What items would be included on a movement permit? Well, what a lot, we're hearing a lot um, are items in the areas of traceability, biosecurity, and surveillance. And so it's up to the state animal health official to determine what they want to include on that movement permit. And the state animal health officials have been discussing for some time things that are common, that they're um, requiring um, between the states. There might be some unique things that one state might require. And so depending where your farm is located, make sure you start that communication with the state animal health officials in your state to determine or to have that conversation and find out um, what they were going to require on those movement permits. In order to help you prepare, we have several resources. And one of them, um, the resources were developed as part of the Secure Pork Supply Plan. So Secure Pork Supply Plan is not the first secure food plan that was developed. The first one was actually Secure Eggs. And what happened was, um, avian influenza is they started talking about, they being the animal health officials, started talking about these control areas and what that would look like. The egg producers realized, hey, I'm gonna be caught in a control area. I'm gonna be under a quarantine, but I'm not, my animals aren't, my birds aren't sick. Um, why can't I continue to sell eggs? And what would it convince you, what, what could I do to convince you that my animals are, are, are not infected? And so they went to USDA and said, hey, um, we want to start having these conversations to develop a plan to help us prepare to be able to show you that our animals are healthy and we can continue to sell eggs. And so that was the sec first secure food supply plan that was developed. Um, then secure milk followed, and then the pork producers went, well, wait a minute. You know, this is a really great idea. We want to be able to demonstrate that we're free from disease too so that we can receive those movement permits in the event that ASF, FMD, or CSF, so FMD, foot and mouth disease, CSF, classical swine fever, ASF, African swine fever, right? So the, in the event that, um, that those come to the United States, what would it take for us to show the animal health officials that our animals are not infected, we have no sign of infection, that we could be able to move animals? So um, that's when USDA started to fund the secure pork supply plan. So again, it, it's guidance, it's voluntary, it was developed over many years of collaboration with producers, veterinarians, members of academia, animal health officials, to try to come up with the best resources to help producers prepare in the event that they get called up, caught up in those control areas. So let's talk just a little about traceability. So from the standpoint of traceability, the, the most important thing right now that you can do that is very simple is to get that premises identification number or PIN. Um, it needs to reflect the actual location of the animals, the latitude and longitude of where the animals are located. Um, that sounds very simple. I know when I signed up for my PIN in 2006, it had, were those zeros or were those O's? Okay, depending if I have my glasses on, they may look like a five or an S, right? So. There's things that you need to make sure when we, when we talk about these pins and we utilize them on, on diagnostic lab submissions or on animal movement records that we get the pin right. It's very easy to switch numbers. It's very easy to enter the, the wrong number. Um, that can, can drastically affect where your premises is um, or that it's not yours. Uh, so make sure that if you have a pin that it actually reflects the location of the animals and that you're entering it correctly. And then start um, recording animal movements if you're not doing that already. Um, it's very important that when the animal health officials come to you and you're in that control area and you're connected to infected premises that they say, you know, when, when did animals move to your site from that or, um, you know, where have animals moved off your site. So you need to be able to show those animal movement records. And then again, start associating that pin with those animal movement records. That's like your social security number. That's what you put on your taxes, that's your medical records, they're all tied to your social security number. That pin is what we tie everything to that site. So that's very important to make sure that pin is accurate. Some people will check a pin and they'll find out that it's actually with the lat and the long that's recorded, something went wrong and it's in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, right? Or in the middle of downtown New York City. Something went wrong in recording that pin. So make sure that those pins actually reflect where the animals are. A little bit about biosecurity. Um, it's important that you protect your animals. You know, for us to get that first case in the United States, it has to enter the United States and we're working towards preventing that. 
but if it gets through those channels, then it, it needs to get on the farm, and if it gets on the farm, it needs to get into the animals. So we have stop points where we need to reduce the risk of, of getting the animals infected, and biosecurity is something that is in, in your control on your farms. And so Secure Pork has a template to create a site-specific biosecurity plan, talking through the different um, areas of risk and what you can do to implement measures to reduce that risk. And um, there's, there's updates that are available. Um, there's a lot of resources if you go to Secure Pork. Um, it can be overwhelming when you look at the template to what Heidi's saying. There's a lot of things to address on there. Um, it may be that you decide, what can I do the first month? Maybe I get site-specific coveralls and boots. Maybe I um, worry about how I'm removing dead animals from the barns. Um, maybe it's looking at visitor entry. What can you do every month uh, maybe to up your biosecurity game and, and get that plan written? Um, if you're not doing it day to day, it's very hard. Um, the minute we have an outbreak that you're like, okay, I have 25 things I need to implement, now trying to remember or have the people on your site, now they have to do all these extra things and they haven't been doing them before and now it's becoming difficult for them to remember everything that you're asking of them. The templates are located at securepork.org. Secure um, this, you're not going to be able to read this, but it just gives you the idea that there's a pork producer tab in the red box there at the top, and then you have several options down the left. One of those um, is the biosecurity option, and then you can go and um, download those templates there. There's one for animals that are raised strictly indoors. There's another one for animals. It's a combination of indoors and animals with outdoor access. So if you have only animals that have outdoor access, you can use that one and just answer the questions accordingly. And again, it kind of walks you through that. We encourage you to work with your head, herd veterinarian on this. Um, they know your site. If you don't have a, a close relationship with a herd veterinarian, I would encourage you to start those discussions and, and ask for their assistance because they'll be a great resource there's a lot of states that are doing efforts with their extension personnel, with their state pork associations and so on to help producers um, that, that would like to have that, that extra um, time with an individual to discuss things. Another acronym, okay. So RABAP, R-A-B stands for Rapid Access Biosecurity. This is a resource that's been developed at North Carolina State University by Gustavo Machado and his team. It standardizes the SPS biosecurity plans. So you're going, oh my gosh, now we have another biosecurity resource. What do I do? They are both contain the same information. The secure pork supply templates are, you can type them in. They're a Word document. You can print them off, hand write them in. We have that working in some situations, maybe where we have um, producers who don't have um, access to electronics and things and the veterinarian's helping them work through it. But, you have options. You have the biosecurity template, or you can utilize RABAP. RABAP has been focusing their resources on different states, depending where the funding is coming from to help the producers. Um, they utilize a spreadsheet. There's um, a lot of back and forth um, to help make sure that all the parameters are filled in. So if you do the templates, you're getting your biosecurity plan. If you're utilizing RABAP, you're getting your biosecurity plan. There, you do not do both. Okay, that's, that's duplication. So again, it's another resource to the point of getting that site-specific biosecurity plan. Surveillance or disease monitoring. Again, it's very important that the folks in the barns, whether that be you or people that you work with, um, look for disease. Now, years ago, we always thought with ASF, what we had heard before it got into China was that we were under the impression we'd walk into the barn and a third of the animals would be dead, right? That it would be um, a, a lot of death loss initially and so on. And what we're hearing from other countries is that's not the case. That the clinical signs can look very similar to what we're seeing with some of our endemic diseases. And so it's very important that those in the barns know where the production parameters are and what those signals are to, in order to contact. So it may be that your death loss, there's a certain threshold and once you get past that, um, that you know to call the, the herd veterinarian or a, a site manager or what that looks like. But make sure that everyone in the barns that's looking at the animals knows what the triggers are on that site to call for a manager or a veterinarian for assistance. We do have resources. Um, we have barn posters that have some of the clinical signs. They're laminated, free to producers. Um, if you go to securepork.org, it tells you how to get those from the pork store, that we can ship those to you. Again, we're talking about FMD, CSF, and ASF are all the diseases included in the um, secure pork supply plan. 
What we do know, talking to animal health officials, is that um, in a confirmed outbreak, that samples will need to be collected and test negative for those movement permits to be issued. And as Heidi was talking about the exercise from several years ago, you know, do we have enough animal health officials to go on the farm and collect the samples? No. Do we have enough veterinarians? Veterinarians are pretty busy people right now. Are they gonna be able to go on these sites and collect all these samples? No. And so what animal health officials in many states have agreed is that it would be uh, very beneficial to have people on the farm trained to collect those samples. Now we have, the acronym's not here, but you have it on uh, uh, handouts on your seats. The CSSC training program, um, Certified Swine Sample Collector Training Program, has been funded a couple years ago now, starting with the National Animal Disease Preparedness and Response Plan funding, which is farm bill funding. Um, a group of collaborators, um, the American Association of Swine Veterinarians, ASV, the National Pork Board, um, the Multi-State Partnership for Security and Agriculture, the Center for Food Security and Public Health, CFSPH, at Iowa State, and SMEC, the Swine Medicine Education <laughs> Center, those will not all be in the quiz at the end, um, are the five uh, entities that have been collaborating on the development of these resources. And they include a, an overview of ASF, CSF, and FMD, um, some information on biosecurity, um, but the idea is that the people on the farm would be, would be trained to collect these samples. Um, the, the training would be led by an accredited veterinarian who already um, has duties that they perform as an extension of the animal health officials, right? And so then we're asking for one more extension for these people on the farm, and they would be submitting samples under that accredited veterinarian or on behalf of them. Um, the training includes a classroom training where you review all the handouts and the videos, and then there's a hands-on portion where the veterinarian shows you how to do the collection and then you show um, that you are able to, to complete the collection. And there's also some information on sample submission. So if you have any questions on this, again, happy to answer. Um, you can also talk to your, your herd veterinarian um, if it's something that they're training to because training has started in some of the states. AgView, so AgView is that data sharing platform. You know, we talk about how do we bring all this together. And so this is uh, where producers can go and upload their information. They can load that, upload that secure pork supply plan. We're working on um, getting the diagnostic test results messaged into AgView. Um, for those that use different uh, companies to manage their animal movement data, working on developing those APIs so that it's not a matter that you have to enter the information twice, but it would transfer into AgView. So again, that the animal health officials could view this information. They do, not, they do not have the ability to view the information until you as a producer gives them permission to do so. So it's your information, it's not shareable until they send a request that they needed and you approve that request and that's the time at which the animal health officials would be able to see and you'd be able to share that information with them in the event of an outbreak. I'm going to provide a brief update on SHIP and get the P in there, okay? <laughs> Swine Health Improvement Plan. Curious, how many in the audience here are familiar with or have heard of SHIP? That's good. A year ago, I don't think we would have seen that many hands. So I'm going to give a brief update. As Pam said, if you have questions, jot them down because I can't cover everything that we're doing with this program. But the highlights are this, we're putting together a program that take a lot of these great initiatives and make it a national playbook. How many of you have production sites in multiple states? How many of you find that it's the exact same processes in every state? There's an even a laugh, right? <laughs> no fault of those states, but they're different. We're trying to put together a national playbook, and it's also not only for us to work together within the continental US, but it's also then we can develop this program to the point where we can use it with our trading partners. We'll have something that will help us in the recovery of our trade exports should we lose those. So what is SHIP? Well, we're currently in a pilot that we're transitioning towards a formal USDA program. This is modeled after the NPIP how many are familiar with NPIP? Fewer hands. I'm going to describe that a little bit more, but the poultry industry has had a program like this for over 85 years. This was, the timing of this program is really interesting to me because we started this at the end of 2020. 
as Anna mentioned, this, this incursion in Dominican and Haiti happened last summer, but our program was already kicked off, and it got a lot more attention because the threat of ASF is much closer. We're focused on ASF and CSF in this program. The foundation that we build with this program can be used for even endemic diseases, but for now, we want to focus on ASF and CSF. It's a collaboration on the, on the poultry side, and I'll go into a little bit more detail, but it's a collaboration between industry, meaning packers and producers like yourselves, with your state animal health officials, with the USDA. I had the opportunity to attend the NPIP meeting just earlier this week. I flew home from Dallas last night. And it's an amazing collaboration where they work together to decide how should we be doing things. And I'll give you a couple of other outcomes that I, that I heard about just yesterday. For this pilot, it's being administered through Iowa State, but we're also collaborating with South Dakota State, University of Illinois, University of Minnesota, and experts at K-State, funded by the USDA, and the Pork Board didn't make it on there, sorry about that, but the Pork Board is also supporting us for several of the technical projects that we've got going on. Initially, the USDA set this up for a two-year pilot, We've already got funding now to take us into year three and year four with the goal after four years is that it becomes a USDA program just like the NPIP. So speaking of the NPIP, the National Poultry Improvement Plan, as I just mentioned, the model is it's a collaboration between industry, state, and federal officials. They've used it over the years for endemic diseases like Salmonella pylorum was the first disease that they went to attack in 1935. But they also have uh, many other diseases covered. Can anyone tell me what you think the disease that was talked about most this week in Dallas for the poultry industry? <laughs> high path AI, high path avian influenza, right? Well. The, pull, the NPIP is meant to sustain export markets and ongoing interstate commerce and movement, right? That's, that's the purpose for that program. And they demonstrate the freedom of disease outside of control areas. So Pam mentioned if we have an incursion, there's going to be a control area around that. And there's lots of good efforts as to describe what's going to happen in that control area, but what's going to happen in our swine industry outside of that control area? How do we demonstrate the freedom of disease and keep our exports open? The uh, information that I heard yesterday at the N NPIP, excuse me, was, you know, the previous high path incursion was 2015. And as Anna and Pam mentioned, our trade will be cut off with a foreign animal disease. Well, in, in 2015, they didn't have their high path AI program fully implemented yet, and 60 countries banned the importation of poultry products immediately in 2015. Of those 60 countries in 2022, two of them banned the importation of poultry. And the other said, help us to understand what you're doing and we just won't take poultry from these states or these counties that are infected. So in fact, poultry exports are actually up this year and it, poultry meat and egg prices are up this year. So they've got this program in place that helps with interstate commerce and movement, but then the USDA has something that they can go back to their trade partners and talk about and say, no, really, our products are safe. The NPIP, as with the program we're developing, SHIP, is voluntary. So that's something that you keep in mind when we say, well, what's the ask here today? The ask is to get engaged, to participate, to enroll and get certified. Because for this program to work, in the poultry side, it's nearly universal. Nearly every egg and turkey and broiler producer is involved in NPIP. And we'll need the same with SHIP to have that critical mass. And again, as I mentioned, it's officially recognized standards, in this case for poultry, and we're trying to develop those for swine. What I also heard yesterday in Dallas was, there's other countries that are now asking the poultry industry, hey, help us to develop an NPIP for our country. So you could ask, 
which we did last year when we first met for our House of Delegates, HOD, there's another acronym for you. Well, why didn't we do this in the swine industry years ago? Why didn't we do this when we had pseudorabies? The fact is we didn't. But the fact is we need to start now. So it's, it's officially recognized in NPIP and that's the direction we want to take it for the swine industry. So what's the purpose? Well, it's to improve our preparedness, not to develop additional programs or initiatives like secure pork supply, but to integrate them in and allow those to be recognized commonly across the states. So we're working towards things that we can do additionally in prevention, like what can we do on the feed side, but also in response and recovery if we were to get ASF or CSF. And again, we're implementing an NPIP-like program for the swine industry for us to experience what's that look like for collaboration? All the great things that Pork Board's doing, uh, that SHIC is doing, all of those great things, well, how do we put those together into a program that can be recognized by the state animal health officials the same, by the USDA the same, and by our trading partners? So it's for both peacetime and wartime. This is the model that they use for NPIP, and without going into a lot of detail, there's basically a two-year cycle. And they come together, in fact, that's what they're doing this week in, in Dallas, to bring recommendations for how do we improve or make changes to any of these specific programs. Now, they're well beyond high path AI. They started with Salmonella pylorum. They've got several mycoplasma certification standards. So they talk about what do we need to change every two years to make sure that we keep up with what's needed both for our domestic and our international partners. That involves, as I saw yesterday, industry, state, and federal folks sitting in the room, arguing, discussing, and then voting on what are we going to do. In the NPIP, because it's a formal USDA program, the outcome of that then becomes part of the CFR, okay? So it becomes government regulations. For our program, we're not there yet. We need to get to the point where it's a, it's a formal USDA program, but we're putting together basically what we call standards that you as producers or packers would meet or exceed in order to be enrolled and certified. And then the states are the ones that administer this. So um, Anna mentioned sovereign countries. Well, in, in this process over the last year and a half working with the different uh, state animal health officials, I realized we're the United Sovereign States of America, right? Because each state uh, has the authority to administer that in their own state. What we're providing is, hey, here's what we've agreed are going to be the standards or the requirements. And then it's administered at the state level. So that's a two-year process at MPIP to get us going from ground zero to a USDA program, we're meeting every year. So we had our first House of Delegates last year. We had 28 states represented. When I first started working on this project in December of 2020, we talked about if we could get 10 to 15 states to participate in the pilot, and hopefully many of the large swine producing states, that would be a success. We had 28 states represented at the House of Delegates last August. We have our next House of Delegates in September of this year, and we've actually picked up Mississippi and Alabama and hopefully Georgia, so that southeast little quadrant will also be participating. So obviously for a national program, eventually this pilot will need to in involve all of the states. But that's a pretty good start for uh, having been in, in, in the process for the last year and a half. So what's the content? We could spend many hours talking about the content, but basically it's taking key elements of traceability, biosecurity, and sampling and testing or surveillance. And the key thing is we're not trying to recreate the wheel. So when Pam talks about secure pork supply, that's being integrated into the site biosecurity planning. We're not gonna come up with a separate plan for what do you do at the site for biosecurity. It's like, They've already got it. Now let's see if all the states recognize it the same way, right? Another example is the certified sampler program. Okay, well, 
That's something that we think all of the states should recognize. That's something that we, we, I would anticipate is going to be one of the standards put forth at our House of Delegates to say that's a requirement. If you're enrolled in SHIP, have somebody trained by an accredited veterinarian to gather samples because there won't be enough veterinarians if we get an incursion. So those are just a couple of examples. There's going to be some heated topics, I would imagine, because when we start talking about traceability, does, does, our, does our industry have the political will to really do it? And if so, then we've got tools like AgView that can help us with, with movement data. Another heated topic will probably be around truck wash or live haul sanitation. Um, there's several members that, that are saying we've got to start making some progress. If you look at some of the other export, key pork export countries, they're at a whole different level, both on traceability but also on sanitation. And so not that there will be a standard or a requirement put in place this year for that, but it will have the dialogue and say how can we make progress and what does that look like? So those would just be a few examples. Um, in biosecurity, there's also a feed biosafety um, working group that's been uh, led by K-State. And that's actually a continuation of all the work that's been done with the pork board already with that group. But now we're saying, well, what would a verified supplier or responsible importer program look like? So that when we're bringing in ingredients, which the only options are from countries with ASF or CSF, we feel comfortable we're not going to bring that virus in. So there'll be plenty to talk about. The House of Delegates is September 6th through the 8th, and it'll be in Bloomington, Minnesota. And if you're interested in SHIP at all, visit with your state, and uh, we'd love to see you at that meeting because we want folks that are um, engaged and want to see this program uh, succeed. My last slide is just, well, how do you enroll? If you're not already enrolled, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Enrollment is at the state level. Again, it's administered by an official state agent's OSA, one more acronym. And that OSA will need uh, an, an enrollment form, and you can put one site on or you can put all of your sites on the same enrollment form for that state. And the only other thing for enrollment is that you fill out a site biosecurity, or excuse me, a biosecurity survey. And there's been a little bit of confusion there. Well, why do you want to gather more biosecurity information? It's helping our working groups in feed, in live haul, truck wash, all of those. It's helping inform them where are we at today. One of the questions is what percentage of your sites have a secure pork supply plan, right? So that's, that's good information to have. By the way, the answer is for those that have enrolled already, which is around 4,000 sites, it's running about 96%, which is, which is really good. That's for enrollment. You send in a form. You fill out a biosecurity survey, one for each state, and that can be one site or multiple sites. And then you acknowledge the understanding and compliance with the requirements, which the first year in August of last year, we voted on some standards, and that'll continue to grow as we need that program to be robust. And that's enrollment. So that's, that's the ask from SHIP right now, is to get more informed, to enroll if you haven't already, and then uh, if interested, engage with us at the House of Delegates in September. So we're going to talk a little bit about what it looks like from a producer's perspective and on what they do to prepare, prepare in, in just a few minutes here and, and um, kind of where that sits them in the event of uh, an ASF outbreak here. So uh, let's take we're going to call producer one. Producer one has been working very hard to prepare. Producer one has been uh, certified um, in SHIP in the area of traceability, um, gotten those pins in place to reflect the actual location of the animals, working hard to tracking animal movements that may be through a, a company that is assisting with that. Um, they have their created their biosecurity written plans um, that could be through, again, RAB app or through the templates um, with the help of their veterinarian. So they've got their written plan. They have implemented everything they can prior to. 
Um, they have a few measures, like maybe we talk about a, a cleaning and disinfecting station, a few things like that, that they've, they've got a plan to implement them, just haven't quite done so on the site. So they've got their plan, they've, they're implementing these day to day, um, helping them keep endemic diseases out, so that's good. Um, they have, as far as surveillance, they have individuals on the farm trained to collect these sample types um, in the event of an outbreak, and they've created an AgView account. They update it regularly. They've got their animal movement information in there. Um, they've got their biosecurity plan in there, um, and so they've taken a lot of steps to prepare. So now if they've landed in the control area, right, now we have an outbreak, and their, their farm is now located in the control area, how has all of this helped that producer? Well, from the biosecurity standpoint, it's helping them reduce the risk of introducing the virus on the farm. So it's helping protect the animals, right? Because they're, they're implemented these measures, they're used to doing them. Um, when they're asked to do surveillance testing, they've got people trained. So if they're told to collect um, certain uh, samples from animals that have died, or if they're asked to collect blood or, or oil fluids or whatever they're asked to, uh, to collect, we have a lot of sample types that they're trained to. They're proficient and they're able to do that. So they can get those samples collected, they can get them submitted to the lab, they can show that their site is negative, they've got their biosecurity plan in place, they've got their pin, they're putting it with their diagnostic testing, they've got their animal movements to the point they can say to their animal, depending what state you're in, they can say to the animal health official, look, I've got everything that you're asking on this movement permit, will you grant me one? And so that's where the level of preparedness has helped them if they've landed in that control area. So on the other hand, on the other. Well. Yeah. So on the other hand, what if you're not in the control zone? Because again, that's where a lot of the focus has been. How do we demonstrate freedom of disease outside of that control zone? So if it's that producer, but you're not in the control zone, but you are certified in ship, which means you've got the traceability in place, you've got the biosecurity in place, you've got the surveillance, you've got an ag view account, you're using that. What does that look like? Well. Where, where you, if, again, if you model that against the NPIP right now with high path, those sites that are outside of a control zone can move fairly freely. And a lot of the state animal health officials are asking, they're assuming you're NPIP uh, certified. I say assuming, they're actually checking. But if they're not NPIP certified, there's additional testing that's required. And another example I would use, again, from the poultry, learning from the poultry is, in, the, in this high path AI, visiting just yesterday at lunch with the Indiana State Vet, he told a story about 50 truckloads of turkeys that were headed from Indiana to Mexico for export. They got stopped at the border because of high path, and, and the, at the border they called back and, and the state vets called back and forth and they said, remind them they're NPIP certified. They reminded them they are MPI certified, and here you go, back through. So I, I talk about this scenario more in the industry, because I believe we need this program for the industry, but in order for it to be successful for the industry, we need as many producers and packers to participate. So now we're going to talk about our second scenario, producer two. So producer two has not yet been certified in SHIP. Um, has a verified pin, so it has accomplished that and knows it's where the animals are located, um, but is not tracking the animal movements yet, has not determined um, if there's a company they want to use or they're not tracking them on paper. Um, biosecurity, they started that written plan, um, but there's a lot of other priorities and they just, um, it's kind of got set aside so they haven't finished it, so therefore they haven't implemented all, all the measures yet on their farm. Um, the, the surveillance, um, they haven't trained anybody yet. They were kind of hoping maybe the herd veterinarian would be able to come out and help collect samples in the event that, um, that they need to collect those samples. And the Ag View, they've been to meetings, they've heard about it, they've meant to create an account, but just quite haven't got there yet. So, you know, we're all well intended. We all have a lot of things to do in our lives and a lot of priorities. And sometimes we, our intentions are there, but we just didn't quite get it done yet. So, so this producer two, now we're in the middle of an outbreak and they're located in a control area. So how has this positioned the producer? Well, with the biosecurity, um, they, they aren't taking all the measures to help protect their farm, right? If they're in a state where they need to share that biosecurity plan with the state animal health official, um, they've got writing to do. If you wanna have your herd veterinarian help you, your herd veterinarian is probably pretty busy now 
um, in the midst of this outbreak, right? So I'm not sure that they're going to have time to help you write the biosecurity plan or implement what the best measures might be to protect your animals. Um, as far as surveillance, um, you know, if you, again, you're calling that veterinarian hoping that they can come out and help collect samples. Depending how quickly you need that movement permit, it may be a while before that veterinarian may be able to assist you in getting those samples collected. Um, the state animal health official may ask you for animal movement records. They want to know if you're connected to um, a, a, a farm that is positive right now. And if you can't produce those, that may delay things. So again, uh, hasn't created that Agview account, so not able to share the data through, um, through Agview. So again, that producer, well intended, had a lot of things that they um, that wanted to get done, didn't quite get there, and now um, they're in the middle of a control area and they, they don't quite have their ducks in a row to be able to request that movement permit. One other thing on the certified sampler from a biosecurity standpoint, when the drama comes, it's like, do you really want the vet who was just at a dangerous place <laughs> going to the next place that could be clean, but up until the vet gets there? And what are reasonable biosecurity expectations if you have to depend on a very finite number of people or one clinic's worth of vets? So kudos to the people who are going to get signed up for the certified sampler here soon. So. And really, for this last scenario, it's not a whole lot different than the previous one. Even though you're not in a control area, if you haven't done these things to be ready, you could be faced with not being able to move your pigs across state lines. I'm gonna talk at two levels here, at the farm level. Might not be able to move out either to state lines or to your packer processor. And then at the industry level, if we're not ready here, outside of the control zones, those, those lockdowns may last a long time until we figure out where this is. You may not be moving animals across state lines, period. And if, as an industry, we're not ready, your packing plant might be shut down. So the time is now. Gene started this by saying, are we ready for ASF? No. Are we better off today than we were yesterday? Yes. But let's continue with the tools that we've got and support the program that we're, we're developing. So the call to action here is to get signed up and ship and to create your AgView account to do the biosecurity, and me personally, I'd say do the biosecurity first because it also helps with every other disease, not just foreign animal disease, and because that takes forever to get people's habits changed if you don't have good habits in place, and to improve your on-farm surveillance. 